Good afternoon all, Steve Parisi here with IBC Global. Hope your day is off to a fantastic start as usual. Today we have one of my favorite guests, Elizabeth Morgan. How are you today? I am great, Steve, thanks. Good to hear, good to hear. So today, um, I'd like to talk about something that we were just talking about. I've run into it a lot of late, the topic of a, a fiduciary, working with a true fee-only advisor, really what it is, like what it means to be a fiduciary, what, what you've seen, like how your firm operates and then what you see out there, and then also what to look for, right? So if you're interested in it, if it's any type of financial planning, business or estate planning, life insurance, whatever it might be, like what do you actually look for as a consumer to make sure you're set up properly that you know, okay, I should do this or I shouldn't do that, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. So a fee-only advisor needs to be a fee-only advisor. And uh, and what that means is they just get a fee. So, so it's completely clear. You know how much you're paying them. If it's a monthly fee or a flat fee or whatever the fee is, you know that it's just a fee. The, the challenge, Steve, that you and I have run into, of course, is people who uh, kind of say that they're fee only, but they aren't. That's their hook to get our clients in. And then they're receiving a commission on products that they sell. So this is such a important thing for, you know, for individuals to understand that, you know, it's the human condition that we look out for ourselves first. It's hard for people to look out for others first. There are lots of good people out there and who, who are fee-only advisors, but the problem is that it's hard to know whether that is really a sheep or it's a wolf in sheep's, in sheep's right. clothing. So I think for consumers, um, you know, the, the hardest question people always ask me is, Elizabeth, how do I know? Yeah. Like, how do I know? And, and maybe, you know, uh, it, it's hard to know. I, I, the way I tell people is ask to see the contract see the disclosures, see what they're saying they're going to get, um, and, and then go with your gut, honestly, because you, you'll kind of get it as time, as time goes on. But I know, Steve, recently you've had a situation with a client who was in that same situation where it became really obvious pretty quickly. Yeah, multiple clients, but I can share the one that we I just talked to him yesterday. Extremely nice guy. Just his demeanor during the entire call. He's smiling. Like I, I like him a lot. We just kind of connected um, along with the other agent who was on the call. But he was looking for just retirement planning. So he had solicited a group that was fee only. They he said, Hey, I do not want to be sold anything. Like I just want to pay a fee get advice, and then whatever you recommend, I'll go to the experts in the different areas, whether it's wealth right. management, yeah. yeah, insurance, whatever it might be. So that's what he started with with the group. And then the second meeting, he says, you know, I was proposed this high cash value life insurance policy, which he sent to us. It was not high cash value. Um, it took him a long time to, to generate a positive cash value. He had a large 1035 exchange coming over, which should make the, the performance better, but it didn't. And just to sum it up, like he looked at it, he said, eh, something's wrong. And uh, like the compensation on it, that other group would have made north of 150 grand. And like the thing is, like the comp, it depends on the policy size and all without getting into details there. But it's like my thing is, like how do you how do you say you're fee only and then come in and try and sell someone that you say this is in your best interest? Yeah. And like, I'm looking at it, I'm like, wait a minute, like if this is me, just because I'm a, a nerd with cash value life insurance, we don't need to talk about that today. But if I'm that client, just knowing what I know in that product, I'm like, no, this is completely messed up. Um, and we showed him that. We showed him actually, I, haven't, I didn't share this piece with you, the exact same company and product that he was shown with the same out of pocket, just designed differently where we minimized comp and everything. And guaranteed cash value, he had not just a little bit more, hundreds of thousands of dollars more in cash value. Non-guaranteed was about the same because the same company and product. And we showed him other options. But it's like, how 
I, I'm just like, how and why? And, and he he was kind of on the same same uh, had the same mentality, but I was just kind of frustrated because I've been running into it a bit. It's just it's not even it's like not the right thing to do. I can't tell you on fee only and then try and sell you something. Anyway, sorry, I got um, I went on a tangent. Yeah, but it's it's a, it's a really important point. So I think you know the the concept of being a fiduciary means that you're going to think about your client rather than yourself, right? Yeah. I mean, that's the concept of a fiduciary. So when someone's telling you they act as a fiduciary, um, in some in some industries, it can be a situation where uh, they are getting a paid from the product, but it's completely disclosed, right? So it's absolutely transparent. So fee only isn't always just a flat fee, although that tends to be the fee only matrix. But if you're going to be a fiduciary, you can also have a situation where all of those fees are completely transparent. So me as a lawyer, right, I uh, and there are lots of lawyers, too. This is not I mean, there are lots of lawyers who are also getting commissions, kickbacks, you know, all of those kinds of things. So. So that's, you know, an important thing to know. The the problem, too, is that when people are out talking about things on the Internet and disparaging certain techniques, you always have to ask yourself, are they selling something? (laughs) You know, what is where are they coming from? Are they trying to convince me to do something because they're selling something or are they really being completely objective? So in each industry, there are groups of people who are being completely transparent and looking out only for your interests. Um, but there are, you know, it's just, it's, it's the way of the world. There are also people who are going to look out for their interests before they look out for yours. Yeah. yeah I, I see it a lot. I mean, a lot of times kind of on the point you mentioned, does it come up where someone has to be knowledgeable, obviously on a product, but then also you have to have that gut feeling to just, do I trust the person with everything going on? Yeah. Um, but I think what happens, cause this has crossed my mind in the past is, Hey, if we're recommending other products, that are truly in the client's best interest because I feel that it is personally, well, there's nothing wrong with me getting compensated. And I, I haven't actually done that, just so you know, like it's crossed my mind. So that means it's it's probably crossed others and other people have done it. That's my point to mentioning that. But like I I, I would imagine like that would be the starting point. And it's there's nothing wrong like if it's fully disclosed and such, but like if someone just goes down that route and then it just becomes a, a sales machine that's you're not really examining each client situation, like that's where situations pop up. Is like that's where I see them pop up issues. Yeah, and it and it's such a hard thing. You know, if I'm an individual looking for insurance or or securities or investment advice, right? And I'm I'm experienced, that's one thing. But if I'm not, now what do I do, right? Who, who do I trust? And truthfully, I am hoping, and you know, I, it's one of the things that I'm going to develop in my own firm is a consulting part of the firm where you know, people just pay us a flat fee f- to go and help them find you know, the best solution and educate them because- you know, that's the hardest thing. And in today's market with, well, you know, interest rates may be going up, but there's a lot of instability and a lot of people are really insecure right now about those kinds of things. So, you know, my, what I'm seeing is what, what, what really breaks my heart is people taking advantage of people who are vulnerable. And there are a lot of people who are very fearful right now. Mm -hmm. So I would just caution everyone to, you know, make sure that you're not leaping into something just because you, you feel insecure, yeah. um, look for someone that you really feel like you can trust. And there are some really good people out there that you, that you can trust. Yeah. So. Gotcha. Oh, thanks for mentioning that. And I know the majority of people that we speak with that they're looking to put a, a ton of money away or a small amount, like the amount is relevant. It's everyone you know, it's, it's all money to them. Um, that consulting fee 
point that you mentioned, I mean, that's that's valuable. And where it's valuable, because I know you don't even have it set up yet, it's something you're thinking about, like in my mind, is that's something I would pay for because the person's not selling me anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's, and that's hard, hard to find. Like people ask us frequently, like, do you provide other services? Like if it's wealth management, other products. And they, our answer is no. I, I've looked at it in the past so many times. And my thing is, you know, what our focus is, is cash value life insurance. That's what we're really good at. We've got other people I can introduce you to that I trust, right? If it's estate planning, like I'm going to introduce them to you if they want to talk to you and your firm. But like that's that's it. I'm not going to try and branch out or, or make a, a commission or compensation off of it because I just feel like it dilutes everything and it just starts to go down a road where it can be pitched as, hey, this is for my interest, which now it, it should not be my interest. It's for the client. This is their money going into a product. Treat them how you'd want to be treated. Right. No, it's, it's, it's really, it's really true. So, yeah. and, and, you know, I think that, you know, just understanding if someone tells you that they're a fiduciary, what that means, a fiduciary is someone who puts, puts your interests ahead of theirs. Right. That's a fiduciary. It, and it's, you know, it's grown up in the common law of trusts. The common law is that it's a relationship. A fiduciary is a relationship. It's a Judeo-Christian concept of, uh, of servanthood. And the idea is that uh, if I'm the fiduciary, I cannot think about myself, yeah. right? I can only think about you and what's in your best interest. So that's, so if someone's telling you that they're your fiduciary, your best question to them might be, what is your concept of a fiduciary? What does that mean to you? Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, I think you'll be able to glean whether they really understand what that means, because I've asked that of people vying for the job with some of my clients and they don't understand what a fiduciary is. So if they don't, then they're probably not the best person to choose. Yeah, no, I, I'm with you there a hundred percent. Um, so kind of with that, with client stories and when you run into situations, um, whether it's with a a fiduciary, if you want to go into anything there. But what I want to talk about is we've had clients that have asked me or they've had conversations with you when it comes to making the right moves with their money. Um, you, you'll you act, in my opinion, you act as a fiduciary. You're like always, you're asking a ton of questions to find out what your client situation is. You did that with me <laughs> to figure out what's going on and then set it up, set everything up properly. So a question that comes up sometimes, a really neat guy, I like him a lot. He said, you know, I had to ask her this, like, what's the point to moving money overseas? Like when I hear people doing it, like, why would I not just keep it all in the US? And I was kind of like, I don't know. I mean, I've heard some things that I can tell you that I've read on Google, but I mean, I can't speak intelligently around that. And and I know a lot of people are interested in that or be enlightening. Um, So if you'd like to, I mean, you can talk about that a bit. Um, That's always an interesting topic. Yeah. Sure. Well, you've teed it up because, you know, (laughs) I'm pretty passionate about it. So um, just uh, by way of background, uh, you have to kind of understand where I came from. And, you know, I've, in my life, I've witnessed a lot of market swings, the, you know, fall of Saigon, (laughs) Um, the Vietnam, you know, war in Vietnam, uh, my family military. So they fought in all those world war two, every war. So, um, and my, my dad was uh, in investments. And I remember when the market you know, fell in 74, it changed our life. And so I grew up understanding that diversification is really important, (laughs) you know, and the question is, what is diversification? What does that mean? And it's, it's kind of what I bring into this asset protection discussion too, that if you are going to be mitigating risks to your wealth, Um, then you, you need, and you won't, we don't have a crystal ball, but what we do have is history. And it's not that history completely repeats itself, but it does, it's, it is a circular, um, rotating, uh, 
situation. So it, it's, you know, it's not the exact thing that happens over and over again, but it will tend to repeat itself. So what we know is that we, we don't know, and we don't know where the next shoe is going to drop. So to the extent that we can fill buckets, right, you want exempt classes of assets. Um, so we want to start with our state exemptions, homestead, life insurance, annuities, 529 plans, trust for children. Then we want you know, to look at the business structure, make sure that is in good shape. But then you start thinking about your cash, right? What does make the most sense? How do I hold it? Where am I going to get the most return on my cash? Then you have to start really understanding banking. So, you know, we have depository banks, we have state regulated banks, we have community banks, we have federal banks. And then you have to start thinking about the difference between banks in the United States and banks outside of the United States. Because if you think about, um, you know, fiat currency and the way that banks are regulated, then you have to start thinking about your cash. And if and I don't know how many of, of your clients are, but but my clients have been holding cash for a while. So if there's a lot of cash and the bank fails, what is your guarantee that you're going to get that out? Because remember, if you're a cash depositor, you're an unsecured creditor of that bank. You're not secured, you're unsecured. So your security has tended to be, you know, an S, you know, a C pick or an FDIC guarantee, depending on what kind of institution you're in, but that's limited. Mm -hmm. So depending on where you are, it has some limits. Some states actually have higher guarantees on cash. So when you're holding cash or when clients come and they have a lot of cash, and my project is to help them determine that their cash is safe, sometimes what we'll do is we'll shop different states because there are some states that will guarantee up to a million dollars of deposits in certain institutions. But then you have to look at the bank regulatory rules, the too big to fail rules. And uh, and that's beyond the scope of our podcast. (laughs) But um, but what's interesting is that some of these banks will not be allowed to fail in the United States. And and what that means is that the unsecured creditors, the depositors will not get their cash back. What they'll get is an interest in the failed institution. So when I'm looking at that as a lawyer, then I start thinking about moving some of that cash into other jurisdictions. And the reason I would do that is if those jurisdictions have different rules. So for instance, a private bank in Switzerland does not loan its assets. All it does is make fees on its services. So the risk of a bank like that failing is virtually zero. Because all of the value of that bank is in, you know, either, you know, bond, government bonds in Switzerland or in hard assets. And there is no risk to it failing because it's not lending for mortgages, et cetera. So, so when people, I know it sounds crazy. Oh, why would I want to put money out of the United States? Well, you know, if you've got a large amount of cash and we've, we've deployed it in all of these other buckets, one of which is always insurance, like a high cash value product for my clients. Then if I have extra cash, I may want to put it in a safer institution, one that I'm not worried about failing. Gotcha. Gotcha. No, that is interesting. So like my follow-up question, if I was doing that is how liquid is it? And granted, you don't always need the liquidity if you're in that type of position in most situations, but like how liquid would it be if I have money in an account in Switzerland? Like, is that something you can get within, would it take a month or so, less, more time? Yeah. Daily. Daily. I mean, it's just like, I mean, if you, Anything. you know, we are so um, ethnocentric in the yeah. United States. We really are. So we don't understand how the rest of the world works. We don't. But <laughs> we don't, I know. We don't speak other languages. We don't really understand uh, other cultures that well but you know the if you if you, again if you think historically right and the way that trade developed and the way that 
um, you know, asset and custodial services happens. Um, you know, the Swiss are known for keeping assets safe, right? Yeah. And um, so they're very, very good at that, but it doesn't mean that you can't get to it on a daily basis. All of those banks are, you know, incredibly technologically savvy. You can go on, look at your accounts. Um, you know, it's it, it belongs to you unless you put it into a different structure. So, and what's great is they operate around the world. Most of those banks have branches all over the world. So just, you know, and that also makes it easier than a, a U.S. bank if you were actually trying to trade securities through wow. one yeah. of those banks, you could trade through a trading desk if you're, if you're a U.S. person in Montreal. Mm -hmm. But if you wanted those trades placed around the world in different jurisdictions, Montreal could get in touch with a desk in the Philippines or, you know, a desk in, you know, in Hong Kong, just depending on what the securities are. So you also get a lot of times a more global approach to the management of your assets by leaving the United States. Yeah, I like that. You know, personally, I like seeing what other people are doing that have already figured it out. That's why I like in some ways paying for knowledge or sitting there and reading as much as I can. Um, but that that's informative because that that I didn't know. And I've heard you mention before, too, like where you'll work with people who are based out of Hong Kong and the strategy could be different for what you'll do to them or do for them compared to for right. me. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I meant? Yeah. <laughs> right. And I think that, you know, honestly, it's such, we have so much information available yeah. to us today. It. So what I always tell people is please start with history, like ground yourself in history and then start layering on um, these other, you know, ideas and news sources. The other thing too, is it's really important to read, you know, what people are saying in other parts of the world. So just kind of FYI, I mean, I subscribe to Al Jazeera. I, you know, uh, the Jerusalem Post. Um, I listen to BBC. I'm going to read the Financial Times. Um, and what's, again, you know, most people can't spend that much time or dedicate that much time to understanding all of these issues, but it will help you have a better sense of what to do next in an ever, I mean, growing global yeah. economy is to understand that um, there are lots of different options and you're not really limited the way that perhaps you think you are. Yeah, that's a, a good point. Um, and, and on the time piece that you mentioned, that not everyone has time to read and do all the research because a lot of people don't. But what I've noticed, and this is just a common characteristic in people because I'm a, a people watcher and I try and copy the people that have it figured out all the time, is take the, the top, right? An example like Warren Buffett. You know what he spends the most of his time doing? You probably know this. <laughs> Reading. Yeah. Reading, That's right? He, he's consuming knowledge. That's what he's doing. And most people don't read as much as him. I mean, most people do not read as much as you, everything you just mentioned, those different news outlets. Like that's a lot, a lot of time to take in and not just read it. Like if I read something personally, I have to always read something two or three times before I actually get it. And then I like read it out loud, talk to myself. Right. Do I get that? So it's a big time investment because I've got to go through it slower. Um, but with that said, like if you don't have the time, that's where people will seek out someone that does like you, or that's why everyone always listens to Warren. Like he, he must know it. It's like, well, he, he takes the time and studies. That's right. why. Yeah. yeah. And that's it's true. It's yeah. true. And, and it, and I do think that there are, you know, more and more, I do think that there are thought leaders out there um, that, that you can find and listen to, but I agree, you know, just me personally, I, I will sometimes spend in a weekend, 24 hours, no kidding. Like, I, you know, I'll do it 12 hours, 12 hours. If it's a topic, whatever yeah. it is, modern monetary theory, what, you know, um, you know, the history of, I spent a lot of time in some German, there's a German uh, public broadcasting company that does great documentaries. And so I wanted to understand Afghanistan and the history 
of Afghanistan and how they've how they had kind of ended up where they are today. And one of the things I hadn't really focused on is how tribal that country is and how all of the desires to have a unified government, which started right with communism, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, um, have failed because it's really a tribal government. Now, what benefit does that have for any of my clients? None. But it was it's an interesting thing to start to think about how honestly, I'll just tell you, Steve, how that. (laughs) So for my clients, what I realized is sometimes like that, that idea that some kind of consolidated government is a good thing. Generally speaking, that's a very good thing, but Mm -hmm. in certain situations, it just won't work. So the way I translate that into my clients is a lot of times I have to back test what I've assumed, Mm -hmm. right? And and so now let's go to the family office. A lot of family offices want to be centralized. There are certain families where the individuals are so diverse that that doesn't make sense. I have a family like that right now. And one of the things I've realized and have started, well, I started uh, several years ago, but I put a system in place to allow them to be separate from each other, which is contrary to the concept of a centralized family office. And so as crazy as it sounds, thinking through Afghanistan, its history, why it failed, actually has helped me understand these family office concepts in a way that I otherwise wouldn't have understood. So I know that sounds weird, but um, you know, to that, to the point though, of, uh, you know, finding a fee-based right. <laughs> you know, provider, you know, there are people that like, you know, and you know, me, I mean, I, I hate talking about myself, but I'm one of those people who consumes information. So, um, it, you know, an hour of my time will equate to, you know, thousands of hours of me just, consuming information. And, and so it is valuable. I I do, I do think it it is valuable, which is why I'm thinking of translating more into more of an advisory. And certainly as I get older, more and more of that, because that is for a lot of people sitting and consuming that much information and thinking about those things, isn't necessarily, you know, their idea of fun, they'd much rather be watching sports or, um, you know. Yeah, I mean, or if you talk to a, a high, a high level CEO or sales professional marketer that could use your insight, and they they sincerely don't have the time because they can't budget it right now to do that research. I mean, from a business making decision, I'll say personally, like it would make sense to pay someone who's done the research already that can advise me in the proper proper direction because I just don't have the time right now. My time is better spent training my company. Maybe it's acquiring new accounts, servicing the ones we have. And that's what helps the company afloat and continue to move forward. So then if you can pay someone who's already attained that knowledge and says, okay, based on my experience, do this, don't do that. Make sure you look into that. And all of a sudden in an hour, you can take all of the the thousands of hours you have in your head. (laughs) Well, and it's interesting too, Steve, if you think about um, entrepreneurs, right? Entrepreneurs... um, if one of the killers of a business is fear and indecision, that's I mean, it. Just it. <laughs> yeah, it. go ahead. And so, if you if you have a way to kill the fear and indecision, <laughs> then your business will be successful. So, how do you kill the fear and indecision? Is you put the right foundation of support individuals around you to provide the foundation of um, right thinking, right uh, positions, so that you feel really confident and comfortable taking those next steps. Because if you hesitate, um, when you're a small business owner, that can be the difference between you know, failure and success. That That's it right there. And I can give you an example too. We just talked about this. Like uh, I'm considering bringing someone on if, if he agrees to it that has a lot more experience to me that, than I do, has 
just propelled companies from a growth standpoint. And him and I are aligned in a lot of ways. Um, now, I do not know how to bring people on. Other, than, We've got employees that, that are great, but people that have more knowledge than me as far as operating a business, how to structure that, how to do it right with not like, you know, giving up a ton of equity. Like I watch Shark Tank. Like that's my knowledge. I've done more than that as far as digging into it. So I won't make myself seem like I don't know anything. But I would just kind of look at it and say, all right, I got to dig into it more. And the reality is I don't have the time to dig into it. So it just wouldn't happen or it'd be five years from now. And it's like, okay, you wasted all that time versus you. We talked for 10 minutes. You're like, all right, here's what people do. Here's options A, B, and C. We can look at this. I can talk to them too. I'm like, all right, I like that. I couldn't have figured that on my own. Like, let's move forward. <laughs> so 10 minutes, yeah, versus five years or forever. Like there's a, a lot of, a lot of value there. And it happens, I think, in, in every industry or for every business owner in one way or another. Um, but that indecisiveness is is huge. Being able to make decisions quickly. Jeff Bezos talks about that all the time. Like operating as if he's still in day one. I mean, now he's not he's not the CEO anymore, but he's still doing stuff. That's his decision making process. Like he'll move quickly. That's the big thing. And it's hard, especially when you're a small business. But if you can have someone that has insight and knowledge or you can acquire it on your own. So that's going to take your time or pay for it elsewhere. Like that, that's it. That's it. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 you know, I think I've said this before, you and I've talked about this before. Um, I really believe that small business is the backbone yeah. of any free, um, you know, society. It really is because it's, it's what allows um, upward movement in, you know, for individuals. And it's so, so, so important. I mean, big business, I mean, there are places for it. It's important too, but I have my own personal passion for small business owners and small business owners. It's hard. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of our young clients are out there getting, you know, all of their buddies are telling them, do this, do this, do this, do this. And, um, and, and that creates sometimes false, uh, a false sense of, uh, of understanding and knowledge sometimes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I, I will tell you that I've rep I've had the, the honor of representing some really amazing business owners. And once they reach a certain point, the ones who are really successful, bring in the gray haired, yeah. <laughs> the gray haired <laughs> person to help them maneuver the next steps. And it's really, uh, you know, it's those kinds of things that I think are really, really valuable to small business owners. Let me ask something on that point. So those people that have brought someone else in, the, the gray hair, the experienced person, have you seen humility typically in those people that actually say, yeah, I don't know this, and they actually bring someone else in? Like, has that yeah. been a, a common... Yeah. Characteristic. Yeah. And that's hard. I mean, if you think about it, Good it's plan. very, very hard Yeah, because, you know, these individuals have had huge amounts of success based on yeah. all yeah. their personality, their knowledge base, et cetera. So that also is, I, I, I'm glad you brought that up because it, it's very, very difficult to go from the kind of ego that, that brought about the success in the business to then being able to set it aside and realize that that old guy or that old woman, you know, knows more than you do about going from where you are today to where you need to be. Yeah. And I think, you know, and I think in some respects you've reached that point is Steve and understanding that there are some old men and women out there who, and I might be one of them, you who, are, well, I'm not calling provides, you old. You're you've got yeah, the knowledge. Go ahead. That sorry. Provides that <laughs> yeah. that wisdom and experience. Yeah. Um, to help you get to the next stage. But but I agree with you. And and I have three sons, and um, I am constantly talking to them about that particular situation. That yeah. um, having the wisdom to set the ego aside and realize that these individuals are going to help you get to the next level. And, and, and it also means that, um, you know, you have to be willing to share the podium. Now, what's interesting is a lot of those older guys or women, they're not that interested in sharing the podium. <laughs> they're happy to let you do that. Mm -hmm. um, 
And you just have to give up some of the upside to allow them to do that, which you, you know, you should be, anyone should be willing to do. Makes sense. Yeah. That's how you grow at the end of the day, but it's, it's hard from so, in so many aspects. Yeah. I asked about the humility because that can, that can stop people. And tip, it's hard to see a lot of times. I mean, that's, I could talk about that all day. I mean, that's something like I've had a fear from day one of not displaying or portraying humility because I've seen it happen to friends and people I used to work for where they, they hit a certain level of success. And then all of a sudden, just like the haughtiness and the ego, I'm like, I don't like working with them anymore. Like, yeah. I'm not going to. And then, and I openly talk about it to like my staff and, and friends here. I'm like, that's like my biggest fear. So like, let me know if you ever see like some jerk Steve walking in the office saying, oh, I did this. Like, no, 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 no. Like I try to use the word we for a reason. Right. Yeah. Um, well, and you know that, that adage, uh, pride goes before a fall. Yeah, exactly. uh, there's a lot of wisdom a yeah. lot of a lot of wisdom in that. So, you know, again, the you know, circling back to our fiduciary conversation. When you think about the concept of fiduciary, it shouldn't only flow one way. So, if you're if you're business partners, what you this is my view, not everyone has this view. I I want uh, I want business partners who a situation where we all put each other's interests first, because then the fiduciary duty is flowing uh, all ways, right? Because then, then you have a situation where if everyone is thinking about the best interests of their customers, and then also the best interests of their business partners and good fences make good neighbors. It's not like you're, you know, pouring yourself out for your business partners. But what you're doing is you're, you're looking at it from everyone's perspective, putting in the right fences, compensating everyone for what it is that they're doing. Um, and if there is no ego, if everyone is goal oriented, then it's a win for everyone. I, I love that. And I mean, you couldn't hit the nail on the, the head any better right there. That's, I, I think too, like how... How we met, I've seen that, what you mentioned in that, that young super couple, I always refer to them. Like they, they have that too, because I mean, they, they're younger than me. And like I, they've done like what our company does in a month, like our annual revenue in a month. I'm like, how are you guys doing this? And I see it, but they don't, they don't boast about it. They don't brag about it. They'll still try and learn from others. And that, that's rare to find. So, I mean, it's one thing to, to find someone knowledgeable, like that's, that's a must that actually knows what they're doing. But then two has the, the humility too to actually learn from others, regardless of what they've done monetarily. Like money is just, you know, money. Yeah. It does, it can be a representation of how you've grown a business, but you've got to have the right head on your shoulders and looking out for others. Like, would I want this if I was them? If I, yeah. every time I do that, yeah. yeah. If I pitched something, said, hey, here's what I'm thinking to you. Like, am I trying to take advantage? Or if I'm them, would I agree to this? Like that, that's the question. That's what goes through my head. Yeah. Right. And that's a really, really important point. Yeah. Can I sit, can I sit in their shoes and look at it from their perspective? And honestly, that's something that you can train yourself to do. Yeah. And, and raising my children, I constantly, that was an exercise that we constantly did. Can, what do you think they're thinking? How would they feel? Um, and, and, you know, in the old days, I think we had less distractions. It was easier to do that. Now it's something you have to be very mindful about. We all do because there's so much information coming at us and, um, and so much about, me, 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 right? Look out for me, look out for number one. Yep. Um, and that is not productive to a civilization. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, um, a, a civilization has to be built on teams, looking out for each other, you know, and, and that is something that, you know, yeah. small businesses, again, I think one of the values that small businesses bring is they're only successful if they operate as a team and they are focused on their other focused. Again, big businesses, 
start to be almost vacuums. Um, right. And whereas a small business has to operate with each other in order to be successful. So that's one of the reasons I don't know if you've uh, read the book Guns, Germs, and Steel. I haven't. Um, it's an amazing book. It You'd have to listen to it on tape. It's so dense that it took me forever to listen to it. But um, the author, whose name is escaping me right now, um, goes through history and talks about, you know, the difference between an agrarian society and an industrialized society. An agrarian society has to be uh, kind of co-opted. You have to work with your neighbors because you're codependent. Whereas an industrialized society stops being codependent. You don't need those relationships. Wow. So that. again, get yeah. talking to about balance, everything is in balance. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I, 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 it's hard for me to talk about what I do for a living and then not talk about history because it all translates into how you find the right solution and what's the right answer. Um, and, and how do you work inside a business uh, and, you know, how do you grow your business? And all of those things actually are very interrelated, yeah. <laughs> even though it may sound incredibly disparate. They are very interrelated concepts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. They are. Um, and I guess to kind of to, to wrap it up, too, as I look at the clock here, um, one of the things you, you mentioned as far as the me, me, me mentality where, hey, I'm number one. And then often we hear from an informational standpoint, it's always warnings and what not to do. What's warnings are OK, but it should never be the forefront of what you're discussing. Like what I like to look at is well, what is the model? What should I be doing? Because like, if you're going to present information, it's like, here's what it is, but may be transparent. <laughs> here's what it is. Here's how it works, whether it's a fee only service, exactly what you're providing, a product, an insurance product, whatever. Here's what it is. Here's what to do. Here's the different options. Not, oh, I wouldn't do this because of a million reasons why or the people involved. Like when you start to be negative like that, People pick up on it. I do. I, I'm, I think I'm more mindful of it than most. Like when I see that stuff, it, it turns me off and I don't want to work with the person doing that. Um, but anyway, the main thing no, is. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, I think it's really true. And maybe, you know, to close this up um, on an optimistic point, um, there are so many wonderful options out there, right? There are so many amazing options. Um, discernment's really important. Um, and, and you kind of practice discernment. That's one of the things that, um, comes through practice. Um, but as bad as things may feel today, um, there are so many wonderful things that are coming out of even this crazy economic environment and, you know, COVID situation. And, um, and I agree with you, stay, po staying positive actually is good for your health. It's good for your, for your wealth ultimately, and it's good for your family. Yeah, to, to everyone around you. Positive. Yeah, you want to hang out with a grouchy person that's just negative all the time? Like, no. <laughs> I know, I know, and, and and you know, we can end this with most lawyers, right? Get paid to find problems, and so my best advice to clients is. I always say, go, you know, go tell your lawyers, you don't want to hear about the problems. You only want to hear about the solution. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love it. You've got a skill set there where you can identify the problems, but not bad mouth the other people. And that's, that's yeah. a skill. It takes time. Well, thank you so much for your time. As always, I thoroughly appreciate it. I'm, I know our listeners do as well. If anyone has questions, we've got Elizabeth's contact info below. Feel free to reach out anytime and We'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye. Hey guys, Steve Parisi here. If you enjoyed the content you just saw, please subscribe, like, and hit the notification bell for future videos. If you'd like more information or to see some custom policies for yourself, feel free to call or email our offices at the contact information below.